I'm just curious, is there anyone here who has never, ever been stressed? <laughs> I didn't think there would be. But even though you've been stressed, have you found yourself in distress? Um, I think we all experience stress from time to time. And um, the last few weeks have been stressful for me for a lot of reasons. Work has been stressful, but it's been stressful for me trying to get everything in place for today. Um, I've shared before that this is not my favorite place to be. It's not my favorite place to serve God. And yet when I'm asked to preach, I always say yes. And then I find myself saying, what the f*** is this to myself? <laughs> But here I am. Part of the difficulty for me is that every time I preach or bring a message, I prefer to think of it as bringing a message, God asks me to share from my own life. And I'm a pretty private person, so I don't share my deepest thoughts, feelings, or experiences easily, and especially not in a public setting. One-on-one -on -one is different. But this, well, I'd rather... Well, I'd rather be doing almost anything else than this. But in an effort to be obedient, I'm here. Ta-da! So, um, the message today is kind of a tag team between Carl and I. And I will be sharing lots of things from our life. At least it seems like a lot to me, but when I really think about it, it's really only a few things. And Carl will intermittently be sharing some scriptures with you. So, um, God has asked me to share with you some things that I have learned, not only during times of stress, but during times when I have been in distress. God has taught me a lot in my distress. But I don't want you to think about me as I share today. I want you to look for what God has done in each of these situations and circumstances. And I want you to hear the lessons that I've learned. Um, because without him, I really have nothing worth telling you about. From the time I was small, I was taught to be independent. I often heard my mother say, if you want something done right, do it yourself. We were do-it-yourself kind of people. If the oil needed changed in the car, Dad changed it. If the lock on the door was broken, Dad fixed it. If there was something in the barn that needed repair, whether that be the building itself or something inside, Dad took care of it. If I needed a new dress, my mom made it. And so it went. We were do-it-yourself kind of people. So as a Christian, especially a young Christian, and Carl and I became Christians um, after we were married, but this independent tendency followed me. When I accepted, I accepted that God, excuse me, I accepted that I couldn't save myself and I sought God's forgiveness, I still tried to do things on my own. If it were at all possible, I would take care of it. Whatever it was, if it was a task in the church, I didn't always ask God's help. If it was something that I could handle, I did it on my very own. But soon, I began to feel overwhelmed, and I began to realize that God's work wasn't my work. It was His work, and it was too big for me and too important for me to do without Him. So in my distress, he taught me to call on his name for everything. The big things, the little things, the things that were obviously bigger than me, and the same thing, even the things that seemed small enough for me to handle on my own. He wanted to be a part of them all. Psalm 18.6 In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. As I learned to call on God for everything, the load I carried became much lighter. My decisions were better decisions and they were more in line with what God had in mind and the outcomes were very, very different. 
I began to see God working in my life instead of just watching myself work. And that's a wonderful thing when you can see God working in your life. In my distress, I had learned not only to call upon God, but I learned that he heard and he answered. Well, in my distress, I've also learned the importance of trusting God. When we were expecting our third child, I awoke one morning having contractions. And while that's supposed to happen in pregnancy, the problem was that I was only five months along. So I get up and I call the doctor and the doctor's not in the office. They told me the doctor was at the hospital and I should go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital and the doctor wasn't there. He was now at the office. <laughs> but it ended up working out for the best because I was um, then seen by a really wonderful OBGYN when my doctor was a family practitioner. Well, the contractions continued. One day, two days, three days. The third day, a nurse sat beside of me in my room the entire day. You know, it's pretty scary to have one-on-one -on -one attention with the nurse. That evening, it happened to be on a Wednesday, and that evening, a Bible study group that we were involved in, they met after church, and um, actually they met during church, and, but afterwards, they stood in a circle and prayed for me. One of the ladies had called to see how I was doing, and I had told her. So they stood in a circle and held hands and prayed for me. Well, our associate pastor at the time, he was more than associate pastor. He and his wife, they were good friends. They were Uncle Bob and Aunt Susie to our kids. And um, after the time of prayer, Bob and another gentleman from the church came to the hospital. And Bob's dad happened to be visiting, and he was a pastor also. So he came along. They came in, and Bob said to me, he said, Marge, we want Dad to anoint you for healing. And I'm like, okay. You know, I was a young Christian. I didn't know a lot about healing. And, you know, I'd been taught throughout my life growing up that faith healing, what we would see on TV, that that really wasn't real. So I was in agreement. So they stood around my bed. They encircled my bed. We held hands. They prayed. And afterward, I looked up, and Bob's face was glowing. It was like something that you would see on TV. His face was glowing, and I know today I still believe I saw Jesus Christ in his face. And I knew, I knew everything was going to be okay, regardless of what happened. Well, three hours after that, the contractions stopped. And the next morning, the doctor came in, and he says, we have to take you off of this medication. I had been on an IV medication to stop the contractions, and then they were giving me a very high dose to the point that even the muscles in my face shook. My face was sore. So the doctor says, we have to take you off of the medication. We'll put you on oral medication, but whatever happens, happens. So um, we had agreed at that point for a C-section because that would give the baby the best chance to live. Well, I stayed in the hospital three more days, and I went home on oral medication, and our beautiful, healthy baby, baby girl was born two weeks before her due date. That boosted my faith in God. <laughs> Even today, thinking back on that and remembering my faith in God is boosted. Jeremiah 33.3, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great things, or tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Well, in my distress, God also taught me that he could make something good out of less than desirable circumstances. About two years after our last child was born, after Mary Beth was born, I was diagnosed with lupus. And at that time, the literature said that someone diagnosed with lupus would live five to 10 years. And I was very afraid. I wanted to live long enough to see all three of my kids grown. I remember being in the kitchen one day fixing dinner, 
and I just leaned against the back door and just kind of slid down to the floor and I said, God, give me 20 years. I passed 20 years 15 years ago. One day while reading scripture, I read Romans 8.28 And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. About a year after being diagnosed, God led me to begin a support group for people living with lupus. Well, I've already told you how hard it is for me to be up here, so I was really stepping out of my comfort zone. But that group was in existence for 11 years. Um, through that group, a lot of people were educated and numerous people will help, were helped through difficult times as they learned to cope. And God gave me many opportunities to share my faith. In my distress, I've also learned that God goes with me. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. When I was young and growing up, we lived out in the country. We lived on a farm. It wasn't unusual to let your animals run loose, but it also wasn't considered um, abuse, animal abuse, if you kept your dog outside on a chain. So we had a dog, a um, little black dog, and generally at night we would put him on the chain because we wanted to see him again the next morning. Um, but one evening we forgot to put him on the chain. And early in the morning I was awakened by Butch barking and barking and barking. And he was directly underneath my window even though I was in, on the second floor. And I rolled over and I looked and I thought, can't be morning already. And then I jumped up and I looked out my window and there was a large building on our property that was engulfed in flames. I went running down the stairs yelling for my dad. At the bottom of the stairs was the telephone, so I grabbed the telephone and phoned the, farm, uh, the fire department. And then I ran out to help my dad get all the animals out of the barn and to safety. Well, my mom and I had planned to leave that morning and go to Virginia to visit family. So after the fire, we weren't sure that we should go, but my dad encouraged us to go ahead and go. He said he would be okay. So um, reluctantly, we left, and then that evening we called back just to check on dad, and as he walked to the phone, there was a window right there, and he saw someone peeking in the window. Well, he didn't tell us anything about that because he didn't want to frighten us. He didn't tell us anything about it until we came home. But every night when I went to bed, I had to walk past that window. And real or imagined, every night I saw someone looking in that window. So I asked my mom if she would go upstairs with me. So rather than leading the way and going upstairs to show me that there was nothing wrong, she sent me ahead of her. So I walked up the stairs, very afraid, and um, finding no reason to be afraid. But when I read this scripture, it reminds me that God goes with me through difficult times. He won't send me ahead of him as my mother did. He actually goes before me, he's behind me, and he's all around me. Well, in my distress, I learned in a remarkable and memorable way that God meets all of our needs. When Carl and I married, he was working in the greenhouse business that his father had founded. Five and a half years after we were married, my father-in-law suddenly passed away from a massive heart attack. And he had never written anything down. The growing schedules and pretty much everything else was in his head. So Carl, his brother, and his mother, they worked very hard. They did the best they could to plant things on time and grow them as they should be. But after five years of struggling, the greenhouse was closed. 
Carl had a hard time finding a job that would adequately provide for our family. I was a stay-at-home mom with a meager income from babysitting. We continued to tithe our 10% of that meager income, and we trusted God to provide. It was three months before Carl found a job that would provide for our needs, but God provided everything we needed in the meantime. We always had food on our table. The kids had what they needed to, for school, and we were warm in the cold days of winter, and all of our bills were paid on time. Philippians 4.19 And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. In my distress, God has taught me that sometimes he takes me away from what is good to give me what is best. I received my call in ministry later in life. I completed my bachelor's degree at the age of 48. So if you're just now thinking about what you might want to be when you grow up, go for it. Um, a little less than a year after that, I joined the church of a staff, that, or a, the staff of a church that we had already been attending for about six years. I learned a lot during my four and a half years on staff. Some of you know the details of our departure from that church. And while there was a time that I told that story over and over again, I have learned that it doesn't need to be told anymore. I will just summarize by saying that if you thought it wasn't possible to get fired from the ministry, I can tell you that it is, because I did. I was crushed. I didn't understand how someone could fire me from what God had called me to do. Carl was angry, and so was I. But God had moved me from a situation that at times felt utterly hopeless to a place of service for him and others that I never dreamed of, I'd never even considered. I've now worked in hospice for nearly eight years, and while things aren't always as I would like them to be, this has been the best job of my life. Jeremiah 20, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And God continues to teach me in my distress. He's still teaching me to talk, too. <laughs> Carl and I entered this year with questions and uncertainties about the future. We received some news in mid-December that has been unsettling for us. It raised many questions, and we are still waiting for the answers. I just love waiting, don't you? <laughs> Whenever I go to the doctor's appointment, I just love sitting there while the doctor gets her nails done. Um, on my way to work every day, I pray that there will be a train on the track so I can wait a while and be late for work. <laughs> And whenever I have a blood test, you know, they tell me it'll take, you know, three to five days before we get the answers back. And I say, oh, Lord, let it take ten. I love waiting. <laughs> well, you all know I'm being facetious. I don't like waiting any more than anyone else does. But as Paul says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but, in, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. In my distress, God has taught me to call on him, and he has taught me to share my distress with others. He's taught me to let go of my burdens, that he is trustworthy, and that he can make something good out of even the bleakest circumstances. I've also learned that he is with me through everything I face, and that nothing surprises him. He meets all of my needs, and he is amazingly patient with me. And I need a lot of patience. And in those times when I am in distress, I know God's got this. Jonah 2.2 In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead I called for help. And you listen to my cry. 
I don't know how God may have spoken to you through this message. You know, maybe you've just been sitting there wishing it was over. I don't know. But if you're finding yourself in distress, God has an answer for you. I promise. Just as Carl and I keep reminding ourselves that God's got this, he's got whatever you're dealing with, too. And he knew about it before you did. Mike, Michael, and Isaiah are going to come and sing our closing song for us. And while they sing, I encourage you to respond to whatever God has said to you today. As Pastor Landon always says, you can come up here and pray at the altar, or you can pray right there in your seat. But I encourage you to pray now. Sometimes we think, well, oh, I'll pray when I get home. And by the time we get home, it doesn't seem so pressing that we pray. So I just encourage you to pray now.